Good morning. Um, I'm coming to you from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. My name is Karen Bala, and I'm the Senior Education Advisor here with Education USA. I'd like to thank all of you so much for getting up so early. I know, um, especially with the, the time change, um, that it is sometimes a struggle. We're just actually ending our day here. And so, um, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm here with my colleague. His name is Darren Haley. He is the non-immigrant visa chief um, here at the consular section, and he's going to be presenting on visas um, today. So what I'd like to do is just kind of explain the format of um, what the next hour will be. I will go ahead and start the presentation, and I'll give you some information about tips for recruiting in Saudi Arabia. Then I'll go ahead and hand it over to Darren, and he'll talk to you a bit about the visa application process and then we will open it up for uh, questions and answers. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll come back to the screen that you're seeing right now, which is our lobby, and um, I'll have this up for at least a while, which will enable you to download any handouts that we have. We also have a copy of the presentation, so no need to take notes rapidly. All of the information will be provided for you um, in actually the first PDF that's uh, labeled SOF, um, oh, excuse me, not SOF, I'm sorry. The, um, actually, it just went away. I do not see it. Um, oh, it's the handout one, the 2013 webinar. It's actually the last one. Um, and then we'll go ahead and go from there. So thank you very much for um, attending our presentation. I would like to um, forewarn you that sometimes it does take us take a while for the slides to pop up. Um, so if you first don't um, see the PowerPoint slide, um, usually hang in there and it'll be up in a few seconds. There's just a slight delay. All right, let's go ahead and begin. All right. Well, the first thing that usually people have questions about is they often want to know, so really, how many Saudi students are studying in the United States? The statistics that we have here are from the Saudi Arabian Cultural Mission in Fairfax, Virginia, and we received these in January of 2013. They're the most recent official statistics that we have, and we see that worldwide there are about uh, 145,000 plus Saudi students studying abroad in a variety of different locations, not only the United States, but the UK, Malaysia, China, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Germany, and the list goes on. The primary destination for Saudi students still is the United States. Um, Saudi students on the government scholarship program often referred to the King Abdullah Scholarship Program, or shortened for CAF, um, choose, choose the locations that they would like to study, and at least over half of them choose the United States. The scholarship program is extremely um, generous. Um, students and their companions, meaning their spouses, um, also are able to study on the scholarship program. So when we look at the numbers, there's about 84,000 plus um, students in the United States with their families as well. Um, so the total number as of January was about 71,000, which is 49%, half of the total worldwide. Um, then when we look at the male-female breakdown, um, obviously we see more males than females, about 76% male, but we have seen the number of female students um, steadily increase. Um, so we're really happy to see, see that number go up and hopefully you're seeing a reflection of that on your campuses, at least those of you who currently do have Saudi students um, on your university or college campus. 90% of the students in the United States are on the King Abdullah Scholarship Program and then there are a portion of those that are self-sponsored or on other programs that I'll briefly talk about in just a moment. So here are a few updates on, um, on Saudi students, um, some information about the CAS program. As many of you might have heard, the program um, initiated in 2005, and we thought it was only going to be around for about five years. 
Now we're going into the ninth wave, and last year it was an extended additional five years. So we can at least see the program going until 2019. The new wave was announced this month. Um, students were notified um, that they were TASP recipients. And the Ministry of Higher Education is just starting their series of pre-departure orientations for these, this, this cohort that's coming in. Um, these presentations and orientations take place across the kingdom in three different locations. They're in Jeddah, Riyadh, and Dahran. And they're one-week events in which the ministry informs the students about the specific program, as well as orientates them um, about life in the United States and um, what they need to do to prepare. Education USA takes a very active role in those orientations. Um, in the next three weeks, we will be attending a total of 10 presentations around the kingdom and talking to all of those students um, that plan on studying in the United States, briefing them about cultural adjustment, um, court of entry procedures, as well as um, answering questions they might have about the visa application process. Um, last year was also the very first year that we saw that community colleges were included in the CAS program. Um, we were very, very happy to see that students could now attend English language programs on community community colleges and then, men, and then matriculate into their um, degree program. So this was quite a success. A new feature of the King Abdullah Scholarship Program is that they are being very, very strict about students studying specifically in the designated fields of the CAS program. There are about 24 different majors in what students um, can choose you know, to study and enter um, into their degree programs. In the past, there's been some flexibility in students, you know, going over and maybe studying, um, you know, maybe sociology or, you know, things that aren't necessarily related to the labor market needs of the country. Um, from what we have been told, they are going to be very, very strict in that students will only be able to study um, within those designated fields um, in the third and day year two to that policy. With the ninth wave of students, um, when we look at the numbers, it's been announced that there are a little over 7,000 students that have been selected into the program. Um, that is down about by 2,000. Last year, there were a little over 9,000 students. When we break down the degrees that they're going to be going into, um, a little over 1,000 in medical residency programs. Um, they do grant degrees. Um, or scholarships for students going into undergraduate programs, but these are only in medical-related fields. And then the bulk of the students, which we have seen historically um, fall into the same category, is graduate programs. And lastly, PhD programs. This is just a really nice visual. Um, open Doors will be coming um, out shortly with the new statistics. Um, for um, this year and where, you know, student mobility trends exist. We see for Saudi Arabia um, that last year it was a little over 30,000 um, students according to Open Doors. Um, I'd like to caution you that these numbers are a little bit low when it comes to Open Doors, often because the, the um, numbers lag by at least a year and do not include English language programs. So we tend to rely on the numbers that are coming from the Saudi Arabian Cultural Mission, especially given that they are the ones that are financing the students and tracking the students and um, providing them with the information that they need. Um, so the last official, the last official number that we heard was 71,000, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, but the press and um, a number of reports have come out that there are about 74,000 students total. Looking at other scholarship programs, that's the other 10% that I was talking about not on the CAS program. Um, if you are recruiting, you'll also want to look um, at these companies and organizations to attract students. Um, there is the Aramco program. Um, as you know, that's the largest um, oil company that exists in the world. They have been sending students for years and um, you know can often find 
Bill Booth at the NASA conference. Uh, the very neat program about the Aramco, uh, Aramco scholarship program is that they do admit female students as well. Then there is Savic, a huge petrochemical company. The General Organization for Social Insurance, um, which acts very similar to our, our kind of social, social um, insurance in the United States, or social security. Um, there's the Technical and Vocational Training Council, which deals with all the kind of like community colleges or vocational training institutes. Often they are also looking for linkages, IPA, um, as well as CALST for undergraduate students. CALST is a huge research institute that's north of Jetta that probably many of you have heard of as well. And then there are a number of public um, Saudi universities that grant scholarships to their teaching assistants. So as you can see, um, the CAP is the, the primary you know, program, the prevalent program um, in Saudi Arabia, but there are also other smaller programs that exist and are worth looking at um, if, you're, if you're thinking about attracting students from Saudi Arabia. All of the websites um, are listed in the website directory that I've included um, in one of the handouts um, in the lobby that you can go back to if you're interested in contacting those organizations. So I'm just going to go ahead and give you um, 10 tips for recruiting students from Saudi Arabia. The first tip, um, which is extremely important, is to make sure that your institution is accredited and approved by the Ministry of Higher Education here in Saudi Arabia. Um, not all institutions that are approved by the U.S. Department of Education or by our regional accrediting associations are approved in Saudi Arabia. So it is very, very key to make sure that your institution is in their database. And not only that, to make sure that your, um, your majors are listed as well as your different degree programs. So um, there's about 1,300 approved institutions in the database. The list is updated regularly, and really, if you want to attract students, you have to make sure that your institution is in that database. Because what will happen is that when the student comes back to Saudi Arabia, they will need to get their degree equalized um, by the Ministry of Higher Education. And so the ministry will go to that database to make sure that, that the institution is, in fact, there, um, and they will need that for employment. Um, most importantly for the public sector. Um, so the big question that everybody asks, and I, I got this question a lot at the Education USA forum this summer, is so how do I check to see if I am on the list? Um, well, you can go to the Ministry of Higher Education database. Um, that is on their website. I have a handout also included um, that walks you screen by screen of um, how you can enter in your information and then get to the page of your state to find out if your institution is there. Now, it's a little deceiving in the beginning because it starts out in English and then it switches to Arabic and then it goes back to English again. Um, if you ever have any doubt, if you want to check to see if your institution is there and you're struggling with the website, please feel free to um, contact our office and we will um, definitely check for you um, and send you the PDF of the information for your school. The next slide, this is just what, what the website um, looks like. And I don't know if it's coming in too clear, but you can see for Connecticut, they have um, the institutions that are listed there. All right, my second tip is getting to know the Saudi Arabian Cultural Mission in Fairfax, Virginia. They are really the arm of the Ministry of Higher Education in the United States. They are the ones that will take over the management of the students and the scholarship program once they've stepped foot, um, you know, in the U.S. and on their campuses. Um, they have an excellent website. Uh, they have a lot of information about uh, the different English language programs that are approved, their medical programs, um, things about Saudi clubs, how you can contact their office. Um, they have an employee directory as well that will list everybody's name, telephone number, um, email address, as well as they will give information about what's happening with the program, um, 
and um, spotlighting, you know, different, you know, and highlighting different um, activities that are happening with Gabby students who are studying across the United States. Um, I know that many universities who come to the Education USA Forum in June often try to make an appointment to meet with SACM while they're in town. So if you do tend to come to the Education USA Forum, this might be a really good time to make an appointment with them um, considering the proximity is so close. My third tip is next, networking with your alum. I can't stress how, um, how useful and how important it is to keep in touch with your alum. They can really be your best advocate. Um, you know, in Saudi Arabia and in the Arab culture, a lot of things are spread by word of mouth. Um, and a lot of students that I talk to end up choosing um, the schools that they end up going to based on a family member or a friend or a father or an uncle or a cousin um, who, who studied at the same institution. Um, I give the example of Portland State University. I think Portland State has one of the largest numbers of, inner, of Saudi students on their campus. They have a very active uh, alumni um, an alumni group, not just for Saudi Arabia, but for the GCC. They often meet with their students yearly. They do a great job in keeping in touch with their Saudi students. So it's no surprise um, that there are hundreds of Saudis studying at Portland State University. Um, a lot of these groups do operate informally in the kingdom. It's very um, difficult to set up. Um, an official alumni association, um, but they do exist. And if you ever do come to Saudi Arabia or you're planning to come to Saudi Arabia, by all means, make sure um, that you reach out to your alum um, and use them as a resource in um, trying to reach possible potential students. Next, it's really important to be a Saudi-friendly campus. Um, most of the students going over um, on the King Abdullah Scholarship Program, as well as other programs, are going to be needing English language prior to the start of their degree. And so if you can, if you have an English language program on your campus, I think this is um, only more so an asset so that student can start their English language and then hopefully matriculate into their degree program. Um, they often are very, um, concerned about housing and finding adequate housing. Um, many of our, our students do tend to choose living off campus, even though we would love for them to have that on-campus experience. Um, there are a lot of social issues with proximity and sharing bathrooms, and especially if people are going over with their families, um, given that most of them are graduate students, um, they're going to want to find housing um, close to the school as well as affordable housing. And so that's a way that maybe your you know, student services can kind of kick, kick in and help those students even prior to their departure from Saudi Arabia. And then um, just providing certain clubs and certain support um, programs for students. I know that there is a huge network of, of Saudi clubs that exist, as well as Arab clubs and Muslim clubs. Um, we've gotten a lot of different emails from students across the United States sending us pictures um, about the various different programs that they hosted during Ramadan. This is a great way to keep your students connected, not only together, but as well as with your campus community and um, you know, sharing their culture and sharing a very unique part of the world. I'm sure that many of you can agree with me if you have Saudi students on your campus. They're very eager to, to share a bit about their language and culture and food and heritage. Um, generosity is definitely um, top of their list. Which next brings me to food. Um, many of them will be looking for grocery stores where they can, um, you know, get food products, um, you know, that are similar to the ones they can get here at home. They're going to be wanting halal um, food, um, meat, um, an area to pray, whether it's on the campus or possibly a mosque close by and a sense of calm, camaraderie and celebration um, when they are celebrating um, and also fasting during Ramadan. Um, it is 
it's getting a bit easier right now because Ramadan is slowly shifting um, into the summer months. So many of you um, will not have to, you know, maybe have some, you know, special concessions for students when it comes to food during Ramadan. But that's also an, a nice added touch if you have any students on your campus um, during that special month for them. Next, it's really important to know um, the educational system in Saudi Arabia, obviously um, more so for those of you who do credential evaluation on your, um, you know, at your institution. Um, it's important to know the application process here. As with many places around the world, um, Saudis who are applying to universities here within the kingdom do not apply until they have actually finished um, their secondary school. Um, so one of the big challenges that we have as education advisors is often explaining and informing to them the um, application timeline so that they meet all the deadlines and they apply in a timely manner if they're applying directly to degree programs. Um, we do get students who call us in June who are stellar students, unfortunately, who have said to us, you know, um, we just finished high school and uh, we'd like to, you know, apply and go to the United States um, next month. And obviously that becomes quite a challenge both with the visa as well as um, finding an institution with following admissions that could still accept a student. Um, so just keep that in mind um, when you're recruiting students and when you're talking to students. Um, you know, any way that you can kind of slip in, you know, how the application process works um, would be helpful. Our students are um, coming from very different learning styles. Um, just now, the educational system is slowly starting to change. Um, a few years ago, the ministry approved um, for schools to deviate from the Ministry of Education curriculum and start to um, offer uh, other modes of learning, whether it be, you know, American degree programs or international baccalaureate. But most of the students that we're seeing, you know, really um, lacking, whether it's in language, English language ability, or critical thinking skills. Um, you know, we have a lot, we talk a lot about plagiarism. What does plagiarism mean? Um, as well as, you know, um, um, how do you how do you write a coherent essay? Um, so these are things that you might face as challenges on your campus, and just to kind of um, be mindful where your students are coming from that perspective. One of my favorite resources, and the only resource that I know to date that gives um, such in-depth information about the educational system, especially when it deals with credential evaluation, is the publication by ECE. Um, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's Educational System and Methods and Evaluation. Um, this was uh, published by ECE and written by Margaret Sanger um, and is just a great resource when you're looking for information about when a university, you know, you know, first you know, entered in its, 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 you know, first class as to what degrees it offers as well as what transcripts look like, for example, from King Saud University. And lastly, um, if you're planning to recruit, it's important to know the Saudi academic calendar. Um, this is the academic calendar for 2013-2014. Um, we just finished uh, the Eid al-Ahad uh, holiday in October. Um, you'll see that there's a winter break and a spring break as well. Um, the best times really to recruit in the kingdom would be um, the times I, the months I've list, listed to the left, September, November, I would say February, um, and April. And be very mindful that if you are coming during exams or winter break, it's, it's almost impossible to meet with students. Um, it's just really not a good time to come. We also um, had the weekend change. Uh, we used to have the weekend in Saudi on Thursday and Friday, and now we are in Friday and Saturday. So as you're planning your trips and coming in, be mindful um, of the work week as well. Conditional admission. Um, a lot of students, particularly, who are getting a scholarship from the university, these are uh, teaching assistants, um, often they are given a scholarship um, on the condition um, that they can study English language first, but they have to be accepted into a graduate program. 
Um, and as many of us know, conditional admission is common at the undergraduate level, but is um, not common at the at the graduate level. So we want to um, you know stress if for any reason you have programs that have conditional admissions at the graduate level, you should let your Saudi students um, know about that, as well as advertise that on your website. Um, I know that there are a number of Iraqi students as well that often look for conditional admission. Um, so this is, this is very um, helpful, both to graduate and undergraduates, in particular to graduates. We would love for you to come to Saudi Arabia. Um, the big fair that many of you have heard of is the International Expo and Conference on Higher Education. We're going into our fifth year. This fair is sponsored by the Ministry of Higher Education, and uh, it takes place in April. This year it's going to be April 15th to the 19th. There are over 300,000 visitors that attend, and I can guarantee you it feels like 300,000 visitors. For those of you who have been, um, I'm sure um, you would probably agree with me. 350 exhibitors. Last year, we had 82 U.S. universities um, attend. So this is a great, a great chance to meet a variety of students um, from from many places around Saudi Arabia. A lot of times, students will fly in. I would, if at all possible, um, plan on bringing another person with you if that's possible. Um, as one or one person, you will be overwhelmed if you are coming on your own. I know that's not always feasible, um, but that might be something that you might want to take into consideration. We do have um, tour um, consolidators that come. Linden was just here in September, and they were in Jeddah, as well as the U.S. Educational Group came in September. So that's another another way that you can get to the kingdom. If by chance um, that isn't an option for you, um, there is a unique opportunity that is coming up in December. Um, it's the first of its kind. It's a dimensions form that is being put on and run by Saudi students. Um, this is happening in Chicago on December 18th to the 20th. It's taking place. It's going to be take, uh, going to be taking place at the Crown Plaza um, O'Hare Hotel, and they are looking to attract um, a few thousand students across the United States to attend this fair. Um, these are Saudi students, um, primarily, who are on scholarship programs, uh, who are on the scholarship program, who are looking for degree programs. Um, they're most likely in English language programs and um, haven't yet found um, a graduate program that they'd like to enter into. Um, all of the information is listed on the website. Um, I believe that they have about 32 U.S. universities that have already signed up. They're looking for at least um, 100. And it's a great way to recruit um, in the United States, um, um, you know, right kind of in our backyard. Although it is Chicago and it will be cold, <laughs> it will be during Christmas time, so um, we might have to all get our flights um, early. Um, next, I would say explore linkages. Uh, a lot of US, a lot of Saudi universities are looking um, for memorandums of understanding. They're looking for exchange programs. Um, sometimes programs are just looking for English language centers to take students during the summer months. Um, I think coming to IECHE allows U.S. universities to network with uh, Saudi universities, and um, it's a great way to start to lay the foundation um, for a possible partnership. Social media is extremely popular in Saudi Arabia. YouTube, um, Saudi Arabia is number one when it comes to YouTube. Um, they get 90 million hits. Um, the average Saudi spends six hours on YouTube, and you can understand why it's, it's extremely accessible. Um, there isn't any issues of censorship as well. Um, so uh, YouTube is definitely a way to reach students, as well as Twitter. Um, it's Saudi Arabia is number one in the region. Twitter is more popular than Facebook. And, and Arabic is the, is the largest growing language um, 
as well within social media. Um, so I highly recommend um, that you reach out to students um, using their social media. Um, they are there and um, often, um, you know, I, I hear my colleagues say that, you know, we have to meet our students where, they, where they're at and uh, this is definitely where you will um, find uh, the use of Saudi Arabia. And lastly, um, you can contact our offices. Um, and we are more than willing to support you, answer questions that you might have about transcripts. Um, we give, we're giving 40 webinars to students throughout this year. Uh, we have live presentations, pre departure orientations. We network with high school counselors. And this really, this presentation today is really um, one of the series that we have planned for the rest of the year. So you'll see the schedule um, to the right of the screen. Um, hopefully next we'll be talking about IECHC towards the end of November if you should attend. We'll talk a little bit about transcripts, um, how to get on the MLET approved list, um, another briefing, and then supporting students once they arrive in the United States. So definitely um, look out for those webinars if those topics um, may be of interest to you. This is just some information about our offices. Um, I have my other colleagues, uh, Nada Adib, who is based here in Riyadh, as well as Beth Franklin. And then we have advisor Christina Abbasi in Dahan and Hanin Kamal in Jeddah. And this is my contact information, and I will definitely provide it at the end of our presentation. And now, I'm I'm going to go ahead and hand, um, hand the floor over to my colleague, um, Darren, who's going to talk to you a bit about applying for a student visa in Saudi Arabia. Hello. Hi, my name is Darren Haney, and I'm the non-immigrant visa chief here at the U.S. Embassy in Riyadh, and um, I'm going to talk to you about the student visa process. Um, as I'm sure uh, many of you have heard, um, the student visa is the sort of the, the last step that the students need in order to actually enter the United States, and as such, you know, many of them come to the embassy applying and, and uh, they recognize the importance of getting the visa. So one of the first things that we consider when we're looking at students is what type of visa um, they'll need. And um, while there are four different types, I think um, the majority of the students that you will encounter will be applying for the F um, student visa, which is a full-time student. But we also have um, programs that would authorize them to enter under a tourist visa or uh, an M visa or a J visa. What we uh, particularly emphasize to students before they apply for the visa, whenever we get the opportunity to speak with them, is we emphasize the importance of applying early. Um, students should be aware that um, it's, it is somewhat more difficult if they, if they wish to travel to the United States, um, for example, within a couple of days, um, than if they acquire the I-20 in enough time with which to acquire the visa and then travel. We emphasize that um, although, yes, we want the, the students to apply early, students need to be reminded that they that we cannot be, uh, issue the visas more than 120 days before the start date. And then additionally, students cannot enter the United States more than 30 days before their class start date. We, we inform the students that they, they need to, of course, obtain the Form I-20 from the university that, that they have chosen. And then we give them information for how to apply. Uh, they, have, they, of course, have to fill out a visa application. Um, and we call this form the DS-160. 
and they can go to uh, a website where they can actually fill it out online. And then after they filled out the application form, they're then instructed to go to the uh, separate website, U.S. Travel Docs, in order to schedule their visa appointment and pay the fee. And then finally, of course, they have to pay the C to C and they can use that through the third website. We frequently receive inquiries from Saudi students, in particular um, young women, about the prospect for bringing a, a guardian with them, a commonly called here a mahram. Now the only official um, visa that can be authorized for a guardian would be in the form of, of a spouse. Um, and, and spouses of female Saudi students can receive a derivative visa um, if they're F1, it can be an F2, based upon um, the, their legal marriage. Although in many cases, a father or a brother can travel with them, um, there is no guarantee of that. And any, fam any male family member who would travel as a guardian for a female student would have to qualify on his or her own for the visa, um, with exception to, to the spouse. So just emphasize whenever you receive inquiries about that, that um, while yes, they can enter and accompany them as a tourist, um, ultimately they have to qualify for their own and their period of stay in the United States is determined when they enter. It's not based upon um, the female student's status as a student. Um, for example, um, female students and, and male students alike are typically admitted um, to the United States for, for what is called a duration of stay. And if they are participating, participating in a four-year program, that could be as long as the four years. However, an accompanying guardian who is traveling on a, on a visitor visa um, would only be authorized uh, six months, typically the maximum, and then, and then they could uh, apply for an extension later on down the road, but that, that's not guaranteed. Here is the required documentation um, for students when they come for the visa interview. Of course, they have to have a passport and photograph for each traveler. And they had to have filled out the, um, they have to have brought the application confirmation page called the DS-150 confirmation page uh, in their appointment letter. They have to have the I-20 for each traveler. They have to be able to show that they've paid their status, uh, fee. And finally, they have to show or demonstrate that they can, that they can pay for their actual studies. Passport. The passport is language I guess didn't populate. Apologies. Um, the passports must be valid uh, for at least six months um, past the date of, of which they acquire the visa. And they must also bring all, all of their previous passports to show any other previous travel. The NIV processing fee. The NIV processing fee is also commonly referred to as the MRV fee or machine, read uh, machine readable visa fee. Um, all of the applicants must get a receipt um, from the Saudi Arabian bank, uh, commonly called here SAMBA, for each applicant. We do not provide visas for, for families. Each individual who, who will be traveling um, needs to actually pay the, the visa fee. The cost 
is $160, or locally here, 602 Saudi Rials. And this fee is non-refundable. So um, if, if unfortunately they are not approved for a visa, the, the fee is, is not refundable to them. And payment, of course, can be made online. And of course, we provide them instructions for, for how they can actually make that payment. When they are applying, they need to show that they can actually pay for the program for at least one year. And they can do this in a variety of ways, but most commonly, what we would look at in the absence of a scholarship, it would be bank statements um, or certificates showing that, that the sponsoring family member or, or the individual him or herself has the money to pay for school. Or if they have a scholarship, they can show us proof of scholarship. After the interview, we provide applicants with instructions for, for what will happen next. Most often, the visas are approved. And we tell them that the delivery company, which is called Aramex, will contact them when the passports and visas are ready for pickup. If we need to see more information from them in order to make a final determination, we'll tell them that. And we'll tell them that they need uh, additional documentation. They may be asked to provide additional documentation to show their qualifications. And then finally, um, if their case goes under what's called administrative processing, um, they can check the status of, uh, of their case online. And then that, that case status will change to show that it's ready to be approved when we receive the approval. Here are instructions for how you can make your fee this payment. And just note that as of July 31, 2013, um, Student and Exchange Visitor Program will no longer mail the receipt proof of payment they can print from the website. We have questions. We refer folks to the website where they can schedule appointments, uh, or they can contact the embassy, or they, need, they can even contact our unit at riyadnid.state.gov. All right, um, so we are just going to go ahead to the question and, and answer period. Um, go ahead and type your question, and uh, both um, Dan and I will do our best to, to answer any questions that you might have about recruiting in Saudi Arabia. Um, yes, Lindy, her first question, is there a limit on the number of sponsored Saudi students any one university can host? I do believe um, that there is a limit. Um, I, I believe it's 3% of your total population. Um, the Saudi Arabian Cultural Mission is the one that does keep tabs on the number of Saudi students at any given campus. Um, when you do go to the Ministry of Higher Education website, there is actually a list of 
schools that are banned, uh, meaning that they have reached sat saturation and that Saudi students are no longer um, able to apply to those universities. Um, in fact, the whole state of Florida um, was on the banned list. Um, so, um, you know, it is a decision that both SACM and the Ministry of Higher Education make. Um, and obviously, uh, they don't want, you know, too many students on one campus um, for the fact that they want them um, to learn learn the language and integrate um, um, into the campus community, um, even though we do see, you know, some universities that at least have a few hundred students on their campus. Um, okay, the next question I see here is the actual process the students are going through to get the financial guarantee. Um, this is something that is, um, I believe that you're probably talking about the King of Zola Scholarship Program. Um, every year it kind of changes slightly. I definitely don't want to be speaking for them, um, but students are often issued um, a cast ID card. In addition to that, they're issued a letter. Uh, from the Ministry uh, of Higher Education. They also do share uh, with the embassy and with the consular section um, the students who have been accepted into the program. So um, they can go ahead and then in check to, to make sure um, that the student actually is a cast recipient. Is that correct? Yeah, you do. Um, all right, next question. Um, how to do administrative processing rates and vary from worldwide averages for CAP students. I'll hand that over to Darren. Wait times for additional processing. Well, the wait times for additional administrative processing, um, they do vary somewhat. And it's uh, challenging to get a hold on exactly what the standard wait of time would be. Um, we don't have official data to, to actually provide a specific time frame. And we, and we tell students that um, we cannot, unfortunately, tell them that it will be processed in a certain amount of time. However, um, the vast majority of students do receive their visa. Um, when, when they do go for administrative processing, they do receive their visa in time to meet their, their intended studies. Um, okay, Julie, great question about do the students know and understand if they're willing, if they're willing to give conditional admission that they actually have to go through the admissions process? Um, definitely it is our hope that they understand. I mean, one of the big jobs that we have with Education USA is, you know, um, explaining this process to them. Um, I think that sometimes the students don't necessarily know what goes into it. And um, often we will have a student say, you know, I sent everything in but the GRE score. And we'll say, well, you know the GRE score, if it's required, it is a part of the application process. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do here is to reach students um, through our various webinars. Uh, my colleague, uh, Hanin Kamal, who is Education USA Saudi Arabia number two, um, that you see has just posted um, a list of the schools that um, are banned. She gives presentations in Arabic uh, weekly. And we do have a series of graduate uh, presentations that we'll be giving. We put Education USA has some wonderful resources in English and Arabic um, that we put out about um, the process to apply to U.S. universities. Um, so we will email this to all of the students who are a CAP recipient. Obviously, it's up to them to read those materials and, and understand that process. Um, and uh, we look at, at trying to disseminate that, disseminate that information as best as possible um, in supporting them. Okay, um, let's see, Mark has a question about students um, and being terminated in students. I'll go ahead and turn that one over to Dan. Hi, Mark. Your question is, do students need to come get a new visa when they have been terminated in students and are doing reinstatement by travel with a new I-20 from a new school? 
the name of the school needs to be the same on the F1 visa and the I-20. No, not necessarily. If they have a valid F1 visa and they change schools, as long as they are current and see this and their I-20 is current, then they, then they should be fine. They can re-enter on the same visa. Um, however, if, uh, if they do have um, information um, that they need to update in CETUS and, and it's not there and they do leave um, the country, they may encounter some challenges when they try to re-enter. So I, I think, you know, from our perspective, um, we tell students that it, as long as their visa is valid and they are um, in CETUS and they are a uh, and they have been a full-time student that they can continue to use that visa if if they've fallen out of status as a student or have or the student has been terminated they need to first correct that and then and then see uh, whether or not they need to get a new visa All right, great, great suggestion from Hanin, just to know who's in the room if you possibly can state your, uh, your university's name when you ask a question. Um, another um, thing that came to mind, I know that um, we had Kristen from George Mason give a few suggestions about reaching out to students, but if you have students who are in your English language program and you know they're going to need to get into your graduate program, you know, Early contact with them, I would say, would be key. Um, you know, trying to reach them from the very beginning, um, even if it's providing resources in Arabic, or even letting them know about the webinars that we have here in Saudi Arabia. Although they're in Arabic and they're here, the student really can be anywhere, um, you know, and can attend those regardless of their physical location. Okay, let's see. I want to make sure I didn't miss one. Um, I'm going to step down here. Okay. Okay. Um, Jennifer had a question. She started working for a college that is currently not approved by staff um, and has planned to visit them next week. Any advice? Do you know what they will be looking for? Um, oh, Jennifer, I wish I knew. Um, I, you know, there is not a, there is not a list. Um, there is not, you know, certain criteria that they have shared with us. Um, I know that when it comes to, you know, certain graduate programs, whether it's an engineering program, they might want, you know, something that's maybe added accredited. Um, you know, I would show history of possibly Saudi students that have, have maybe gone to your university regardless of um, the university being on the list or not. I would also seek out um, individuals um, that work at college and, colleges and universities in your area um, to talk to them um, about their contacts with Stackham and um, if they might be able to, to offer any insight. Because I really haven't gone through that process, um, I rely on other people um, in explaining that to me. Um, and like I said, I haven't seen any documentation, anything you know, that's showing the transparency of the process. Um, but I wish you all the best in um, your visit to Sackham next week. Okay. Um, Eileen asked a question about lately students who say they are sponsored by the cultural mission who claim they need an admission decision within days of contacting us or they will lose their funding. Is there any truth to this? Um, is it new this year? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I've never heard of anything quite like that. I do know that often what will happen, I mean, is students will go um, to the United States and they will um, self-fund their studies. And then once they get to the U.S., they will reach back to the Saudi Arabian Cultural Mission and ask um, that they be granted a scholarship. Um, so there might be um, some connection there um, where um, there has been a deadline placed on the, you know, from the cultural mission on the student. Um, but um, I'm not sure of that. I will definitely ask that question and I will take note of that. And if you send me your um, 
send me an email to my email address that's listed below, bowerkm at state.gov. I will get back to you um, with an answer if I find anything like that. Okay, um, there's a question about, um, there seems to be two different letters for the scholarship program. One says admission only, and the other says financial guarantee. If the students are required to have sufficient funds, how can they obtain a financial guarantee letter before arriving in the state? Do you know anything about those two documents? No. No. Okay. Um, yeah, I have heard, uh, Micaiah, about the, 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 the letter that basically says you have been granted a scholarship and then a financial guarantee letter. Um, and um, once again, you know, often we can, um, in the conference section, they can go ahead and they can look and see if a student has uh, been granted a scholarship from the list that we get from we the ministry. We receive the list. The right. higher education. We receive the list and we will go on that list. Right. The um, but we can go ahead and, um, once again, I will, I will ask that question to see if there's any changes this year. Um, we will probably have a meeting later on um, this month, um, especially because we'll be a part of that Cleanup Bill of Scholarship program um, pre-departure orientation. Um, so that will be another question um, that we will pose to them. Is there a limit on how long a student has to complete English language under the Stackham Scholarship? Um, yeah, when do, usually the student is given anywhere from 12 to 18 months to complete um, English language. Um, that has been the duration of time that we, has, we have always been given. I don't know if there are exceptions um, when that time is actually um, extended. I think the real key that students um, don't take into consideration is how their English language study aligns with applying to a degree program. And um, once again, it goes back to that application timeline where if the student doesn't understand that timeline and, you know, they finish their language in August um, and then they want to get into a degree program, obviously it's a bit too late. Um, so reaching out to the students and explaining the, the application timeline is really essential in making sure that they can, they can enter into a program um, as soon as they finish their language. Thanks. So Mark Powell just made a comment about um, the, the FAO document is for admission purposes only. SACM will issue a financial guarantee once they know the student has enrolled in the program and has started studying. Thanks a lot, Mark, um, for that information. And once again, I'll confirm all that um, in, in my next meeting. Um, yes, um, Nicola, the presentation um, is being recorded. And uh, I will definitely lead you um, to the lobby in probably a few more minutes once we're done with the questions and you can download uh, the PDF of the PowerPoint presentation as well as a lot of the support material um, that we discussed um, today. Okay, um, it's almost exactly 5 o'clock here, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move to the lobby. There is a chat box in the lobby, um, and I'll be here for a little while to answer um, any other questions that you might have. Um, but behalf on the U.S. Embassy in Education USA, and with the help of Darren, um, we'd like to thank you so much for attending um, our first. Education USA webinar for U.S. institutions, and we look forward to having you at our presentations um, throughout the, the rest of the year. Thank you so much.